it started. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, Miriam. So tell me about a little bit. Uh, how did you do the dress? Uh, how did you do this incredible transition with the form and uh, maybe painting the, those amazing dots on the dress? Just tell me something yes. about it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Dress. Um, so you know, I love painting material and I love painting texture and I love painting form and. It, it, the dress, in a sense, represents everything I love to do with painting, um, but this dress killed me. <laughs> I didn't expect, I thought this was going to be a walk in the park, I mean, a hard work, everything's hard work, but I thought the dress was going to be a walk in the park for me, because I, I, I thought I knew that I was on in my comfort zone with the dress, but there was just something about the texture of it, and, and the way the light reflected off it, of course, all the things that attracted me to it. And it just, that's very particular blue that it had. Um, so I went over this dress about 20 times before I really? felt I could live with it. Yeah, mm. it was incredible. Um, and, it, and I sort of left it till the end as well. So you're always, you know, on a big painting like this towards the end, it's, you're at the kind of having given birth stage. You're really, mm. <laughs> you're almost psychologically drained with the work, you know, and you have to really, if, if you encounter a difficult bit at the end of the painting, you have to really dig deep to get through that and get it done. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so it's, you know, the, the, I always start pretty much with three tones, so I, pretty much with every part of, the, you know, the painting. So the dress is actually a really good vehicle for explaining um, my painting process a little bit. So I try to identify the mid-tone, the light tone and the dark tone. Mm. Um, and that's kind of the principle of describing form in its simplest. So, you know, if you were going to do a diagrammatic description of a sphere or a cube yeah. or whatever, you'd have to find three tones minimum in which to do it. So I work out the three tones on the palette. And, you know, the colour mix can sometimes be incredibly simple. Sometimes it can be quite complicated. With this one, it was quite complex because it was this very particular blue. And, of course, blue being one of the primary colours, um, that you have to really identify the right blue. Otherwise, you just get taken down completely the wrong path. Um, so anyway, once you have those three tones, of course, you know, before you know it, those tones are fragmented into six tones or seven tones or eight tones on your palette. But those three tones are like your building blocks, they're what you always come back to. So you always know you can go back to the kind of the beginnings of the archaeological dig, as it were, because you've got the formula for those three tones. And I don't mean literally formula, but, you know, that's that's kind of the, the, the structure. Um, and so I did the kind of modulation of the dress without, without describing any of the texture at first. And then I probably go over that two or three times before I feel I have a subtle enough sense of modulation. And probably by the third layer, a little bit of glazing will have crept in. And I'll talk a little bit more about glazing, but glazing is my way of, of, of just bringing in very subtle sense of form and kind of spatial relationships in the painting. Um, so areas like this will have been glazed many, many times. Um, so it's really the old master works. It's and very much the old master technique, exactly. And, yes. and, and it's where you get this incredibly subtle sense of form and roundness, which would be quite hard to describe without glazing, and not impossible at all. But just glazing brings a particular quality to the painting, which I particularly love. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it, it's just my way of doing it. Um, and then after that stage where I thought the form had been, you know, described to a high enough level, I started to bring in the texture of the dress. And of course, that's when it all went nuts. <laughs> <laughs> because it kind of looked garish at first, you know, because it is like a, it was, it was just too much. And then I had to tone it down and then I had to, um, so, you know, when, when you, when you paint in a figurative way and actually what life is giving you is not sympathetic to the painting or is not looking good on the painting, then you have to, you have to find an interpretation of that that will work for your painting. And that's actually quite difficult to do sometimes, you know, because then you have you have to step outside of what you see and actually invent it, reinvent it, deconstruct it and reconstruct it, as it yes. were. I think that's what happened here. Um, and that took a few goes before I felt that I had just the right, a sense of the dress, a sense of this lovely glimmer and the way it catches the light, but without it being too... 
uh, without it overpowering the painting, really. Um, anyway, that, I hope that's what I achieve. Yeah, that's fantastic, um, yes. And um, of course, you, you know, you have the glare of the dress and then you have this wonderful brooch and you have the pearl necklace and you have her wonderful glowing skin. And uh, there's so many points of light in a very, and of course the chair. Um, so this intentionally was the focal point of light in the painting. Actually, that's very interesting. So you should talk about a little bit about the lights. Uh, let yeah, me just, so the um, light, I mean, gosh, light is everything in a painting. So, yes. Um, so yes, right from the go, from right, right from the beginning, I knew that I wanted to create a sense of light around her head. Oh. Almost like a sense of aura. Um, and I knew the gold of the chair was a gift for that. And also it's a very regal touch. And if you think about auras described in paintings, Fantastic, they're yeah. always a golden, a golden halo of light. And without Absolutely. being kind of wanting to be literally that, I just wanted to just bring a suggestion of that into the painting. And also, of course, the Queen has this wonderful white hair, which is so iconic. I mean, it is her thing, you know, her amazing white hair. And that's also like a glow of light around her head. And so all these things were a bit of a gift to work with, really. And because I love, and again, it's something else that you can do so well with glazing. I love to really pull the lights and shadows in the painting. That's really where I just kind of get lost in the painting process. That's fantastic, yeah. So this is the highest point of contrast in the whole painting. It's Let just come closer. her yes. shoulder against the gold of the chair. It's kind of really, and everything else, yeah. I know there's a lot of color and there is a lot of light in the rest of the painting, but n nowhere else to that degree. So that's really, and, and you know, you, you'll find it's a very classical technique that there'll always be a a focal point of contrast the light in a painting that draws your eye it's 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 the way the painter tells the viewer where to look at the work we're being control freaks we're saying that you're going to look there first and then you're going to yeah. and then you're going to take a walk around the rest of the painting yeah it's very true it's a beautiful light there and yeah. that's uh, the tonal uh, values is changing all the way down yeah. to the chair yeah. and uh, and so you know my natural tendency is to have actually much darker grounds than this painting has so there's a lot more light in this painting that I mean there's a, you know a dark background and the glow of skin or a face against a dark background is a gift for any painter so you look at a Rembrandt you look at a Velasquez you, it's just such a classic yes. formula you can't if you know what you're doing you can't go wrong it's a gift and the minute you step out of that formula you're you're creating a whole set of problems for yourself compositionally I mean they're, they're, they're nice problems they're good problems to solve um, you know, so there is a lot going on in this work, um, and I just had to really be careful that that it was all balanced. Really, it's just really all about creating a balanced sense of composition um, and a sense of space. That's something that's really important to me. I love creating um, that sense of space that your eye feels it can wander into and get lost in. I think that's a very magical quality in paintings. It's, it's what draws me to paintings when I look at them. There's a kind of mystery there. You know, you wonder what's behind that sleeve that's disappearing into the shadows. Mm. And, you know, you kind of, it, it, it's, it's like a seduction, really. It's very sensuous. You just want to feel that space, you know. Um, so I love to create that in paintings as much as I can. But yeah, so the dress had to kind of, it, 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 it risked kind of overpowering everything else that I had spent mm. months carefully balancing and constructing. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Did you do the dress first or no, you dress, did it the last, it was the last, last minute? Yes, yeah. I mean, I had, I had sort of blocked it in very crudely. Yes. Um, but again, because, I, because I, I thought I knew what I was doing with the dress, it was kind of, well, you know, I, I, I can tackle that at the end. And of course, it just proved very, um, very difficult. But you know, sometimes it's the areas of great struggle where you sometimes, not always, but you know, sometimes that's where you. I mean, the challenge is always good. I think you yeah. always thrive on the challenge as, 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 yeah. as, as well as in any craft, really, yeah. but as a painter as well. I remember that when I saw you first starting the painting, you started with a carpet. Yes. And you were working on the carpet <laughs> equally intensive. The carpet way. Was, yeah. Yes. But I always do that. I always have to set. The, I think because I'm so concerned with space in a painting and the pictorial space, I, you know, unless you're doing literally a head and shoulders with just a, a very a dark or light ground or just a flat sort of abstract with just a slight light shift um, you know when there is a sense of um, spatial st structure in the painting I really have to get that in 
before I can move on to the subject. It's almost like you're setting, you're literally setting the stage for your actor to come in. Absolutely, and, take, and, yes. and kind of shine, really, yeah. you know, that's, that's how I see it, that's how my mind works. So, so I have to get all those elements keyed in. So actually, she was, she didn't really start to appear until halfway through the painting process. Oh really? Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. And it's almost like, um, yeah, it's almost, it, it, there's an element of saving the best to last as well, because you're kind of, you're painting all these elements in the painting and knowing that you're just dying to get to that laser in the hair, or you're just dying to get to the skin, which is just such a wonderful thing to paint. And, um, so there's a lot of discipline um, going on. I think there's a lot of discipline behind good painting. Yes, and that's, that's my very personal philosophy. Yes, yes, it, it, yes. Even painting that might appear just like a sort of primal scream or, you know, there's always a lot of thought and discipline mm. behind the painting process. Oh, fascinating. Um, I yes. think painting, I actually think personally painting is a very, when it's done well, it's a very intelligent process. And it has a kind of internal logic in and of itself. And if you respect that and you follow it, you know, the, the result comes.